my name is Nazareno Pierdicca, Mauro Pierdicca for friends and everyone. And I am chairing this uh, uh, modeling uh, remote sensing uh, technical committee of the GRSS Society uh, since uh, almost one year. And uh, in the past, we have already organized the other uh, webinar, and particularly uh, a webinar was uh, taken by uh, Valeri Zavorotini about the small slope approximation model, and then Professor Varez Perez about the integral equation model. And now uh, that we're mostly uh, devoted to modeling the backscatter uh, and or the bystatic scattering. And uh, now we are going to focus on uh, microwave uh, radiometry, basically. And so I would uh, very I'm very happy to introduce uh, uh, Catherine Prijan. Uh, she is a well known uh, uh, scientist uh, in the uh, field of. Uh, and microwave radiometry. And uh, I think I can give directly the floor to Catherine that uh, will introduce uh, herself, of course, and the webinar will uh, be on, um, will last about uh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I don't know, Catherine, which is the, uh, the, the time frame you have planned. And then we may have some time to discuss and to make question uh, so uh, okay so you probably want... we can start so if you share your the screen and then you yes can you see my screen yes if you can uh, use the full screen mode okay fine very good this is it yeah okay so my name is Catherine Pridgent. I work in the National uh, Research Center in France uh, at the Observatoire de Paris. And I'm also working for Estelus, a private company uh, that I jointly uh, founded with a colleague, Philippe Perez. And uh, I will talk about the challenges in microwave surface emissivity estimation. And uh, I have to, to thank contributions from many colleagues, including Felipe Perez, Carlos Jimenez, Liz Kivik. And uh, I have been working on that, in that field for many, many years now, more than 30 years, and working on surface properties in microwaves, but also for atmospheric uh, retrievals and atmospheric um, gas absorption, for instance. Okay, so it's the beginning of a golden era for passive microwave Earth observations in Europe, um, because the future European microwave instruments will cover the full microwave spectrum. Do you see the, the arrow here? Maybe I should use a pointer. Do you see the pointer? So this is um, the, the, the atmospheric opacity as a function of frequencies uh, between zero and 700 gigahertz and for a mid-latitude atmosphere. And so far we have been observing in this region for Earth's, um, for Earth's uh, studies. So this is the, the, the satellites today are observing in this frequency range between zero and 200 gigahertz mostly. And in the future, uh, there are plans and very serious plans because some of them will be launched very soon for uh, missions that will extend the frequency range up to 664 gigahertz with the ice cloud imager uh, that will be on board the meteorological operational uh, mission, uh, METOPSG. And uh, so these are in uh, purple, the IC channels that will uh, cover part of the spectrum. And we will also have simultaneous observations between 1.4 and 30 gigahertz with a new instrument, a Copernicus Imaging Microwave Radiometer that will observe here. And two other instruments, the Microwave um, Imaging 
um, imager on board Metopes G as well, and a microwave sounder as well on board Metopes G. So we will have a full coverage of the of the frequencies observed uh, by um, passive microwave uh, for uh, climate and weather forecast studies. In terms of numerical weather prediction, the next challenge is to assimilate all surface radiances. So far, most of the work is done over ocean because the, the, over other surfaces, uh, there is a contamination uh, from the, the surface em emission, and it is very difficult to, uh, to extract the atmospheric signal. So, this is in time what has been going on in terms of numerical weather prediction. So uh, from one DVAR retrievals, they move to three DVAR and for, to four DVAR. Now they are assimilating all sky radiances, meaning that they are assimilating under clear and cloudy uh, uh, atmospheres. But the next challenge is to assimilate radiances under all sky condition, but also over all surfaces. And that clearly requires an accurate estimation of the surface contribution for all surface sensitive observations and for all surfaces. So the outline of the talk will be the following. First of all, general consideration about the microwave surface contribution to the satellite observation. We'll talk a little bit about the ocean and then about land, snow, and sea ice, where the, the, the challenges are uh, stronger. And I will conclude. First of all, this is the atmospheric transmission in the microwave from zero to 700 gigahertz for different atmospheres at nadir. And uh, in at what we call atmospheric windows, um, we can observe the surface more or less and the surface contribution is the information. So in, in these windows where the transmission is high enough, we can observe the surface. This is a case for instruments such as SMOS or SMAP, where you can retrieve soil moisture, sea surface salinity, vegetation information, eye thickness, and many others. Or other instruments, that is for the lower frequencies at 1.4 gigahertz and at higher frequencies, uh, AMSUR, SSMI, GMI, and many other instruments where you can observe sea surface temperature, ocean wind, and many other surface parameters. So these where um, we were talking about atmospheric window, where the surface contribution was the information. And the atmospheric characterization, this, uh, for atmospheric characterization, the surface contribution is not the information, it is a source of noise. And we are using uh, this uh, type of frequencies here so far uh, to uh, estimate the atmospheric contribution in places where the atmosphere is more or less opaque, uh, depending on the, on the location of the channel with respect to the spectral lines. And uh, these are used by sounders such as ANSU, MHS, ATMS, and many other. But still, in this uh, frequency range, especially uh, on the on the side of the on the sides of the uh, spectral lines, you have some contribution from the surface, and this has to be taken into account uh, to have a correct atmospheric retrieval. So, in that case, the surface is the noise in your uh, observations. It's not the signal; it is a noise, but you have to account for it. Uh, and you can see that under some uh, type of atmospheres, you still have some contribution from the atmosphere at uh, frequencies as high as 300 gigahertz, especially for very cold and dry atmospheres. So there is a need for all these applications uh, to, uh, to estimate the surface contribution uh, correctly in order to retrieve the right signals. So what is measured by a microwave uh, instrument on board a satellite? Uh, it is measuring the brightness temperature, and this is a very simple relative transfer equation that takes into account the direct emission from the surface, 
with the emissivity of the surface here and its surface temperature here, and it's the transmission of the atmosphere here. Okay, the contribution from the atmosphere that is being reflected by the surface and sent back to the to the to the instrument here, and the direct contribution from the atmosphere. And in transparent channel channels, uh, the signal that is measured from the from the from the satellite is directly the surface temperature temperature multiplied by the emissivity. But this is a very simple equation, but it, in most cases it's not that simple because you have surface reflection and scattering, as well as you can have volume scattering depending on the medium. But here we, we will be talking essentially about the emissivity that is um, or, or the surface emissivity in the microwave. Um, this is um, an animation where you can see uh, the changes in emissivity over land and ice over a year. Okay, these are the months here at 19 gigahertz in horizontal polarization. And you can see that um, it changes uh, from a location to the next, but also with time. So the emissivity in the microwave is changing a lot spatially and temporally. And for comparison, this is the emissivity uh, for the infrared in this frequency range, in, in this wavelength range. And you can see that except for desert places, um, the emissivity is much, much, uh, it's much uh, more stable uh, with location. And it is as well with time, because here it moves from 0.75 in terms of emissivity up to, up to one. Uh, in infrared, it is much closer to one most of the time. So an accurate estimate of the surface contribution is needed in the microwave at global scale. And this is through across frequencies from low microwaves to millimeter waves, across observing condition, depending on the incidence angle and polarization, and across applications, meaning for atmospheric retrievals, as well as for the retrieval of surface properties. And consistency is required to exploit the multi-frequency, multi-instrument capacity for both atmospheric and surface characterization. And this is especially important uh, because uh, numerical weather prediction is uh, trying to do some couple land ocean atmospheric assimilation uh, all together. So you have to have consistencies across these different instruments and for the different applications. So a few words about the ocean. Ocean surface is a rather homogeneous surface, at least compared to the other surfaces. And actually robust radiative transfer models exist. So depending on the, um, on the, on the surface in presence and depending on the wind speed mostly of the ocean, we will have a different behavior. For a flat ocean surface, specular reflection applies with dielectric properties related to the surface temperature and salinity. When the wind increases, the surface roughness increases with relationship between the wind speed and the wave spectrum that can be modeled. And the, when the wind keeps increasing, foam is produced. And with foam having a high emissivity compared with um, the seawater, it has to be taken into account. This is um, a, a revisit of the very famous figure from Tom Willite in 79, uh, providing you with a normalized sensitivity of the passive microwave observation to the different ocean parameter between zero and 40 gigahertz. So this is a normalized sensitivity of the brightness temperature with respect to a given parameter. And the parameters are given here. So this is a sensitivity to the sea surface um, temperature with a maximum sensitivity around 6 gigahertz for sea surface salinity here and for ocean wind speed here. And here we have been taking into account the atmospheric uh, absorption. So you can see that depending on the frequencies, you will have different sensitivities to the, to the, to the 
different parameters. So there are different ways of estimating the sea surface emissivity. You have physically based models, and here is a list of uh, different models. And a two scale model is to be soon available to the community, and I will say a few words about it. Uh, there are also fast models that correspond to parameterized uh, version of the physically based models. And here are examples, and they are distributed with uh, community models. And you have also models fitted to satellite observations, such as the remote sensing system model by Tom, uh, Thomas Meissner and, and, and co. And they all include a dielectric model, a wind-driven roughness model, and a foam model. So, as I said before, this uh, physically based model um, exists, and an international team has been formed recently to work on the development of this model, and it is called PARMU actually, and it is physically based uh, from the microwaves to the infrared for both active and passive mode, and you have a publication here that where you can find more information about it. And the first action was to evaluate the different current models. Uh, and here is, for instance, the, the model that we are using right now as a function of SST and as a function of ocean wind speed compared to the former model FASTEM and compared to uh, the model from uh, Toma, Thomas Meissner. And uh, this is at like 6 gigahertz vertical polarization, 36 gigahertz vertical polarization. And here it's a difference between the observation and simulation uh, for um, given from uh, answer E in the, for this one. But comparisons have been made with many different uh, instruments. And major discrepancies have been found for cold temperature temperature and for high wind speed. So uh, we have been working on, the, on uh, fixing uh, as much as possible these problems and I won't go into the details but um, we there are different um, different um, measurement that have been provided at 1.4 gigahertz for instance of, of the dielectric properties for SMOS and SMAP and that can help uh, fix the different problems that there was uh, with uh, the previous models. And uh, there is also a large variety of models for foam coverage and foam emissivity. And um, we have been selecting uh, the coverage and foam emissivity that, will, that fits better with, with the, the observations. So we now have a physically based reference model of uh, um, selected. It is the passive and active reference microwave to infrared for ocean, PARMIO. It has been extens extensively evaluated with multiple observations and adjustments have been made uh, to the initial model to better fit the observations. And um, neural network fast code has been developed very recently, derived from this model with similar inputs as FASTEM along with Jacobians and error estimates, its name is Surf, Surfem Ocean, to be included in RTTOF in the next version. So that was for the ocean. What about land, snow, ice, and sea ice? The problem with these uh, different surfaces is it's, it's highly heterogeneous, and there is a very complex interaction between the surface and the radiation. And radiative transfer modeling are still very challenging because you have to deal with surface reflection and scattering as well as with volume scattering. So the question are how to realistically simulate the surface contribution, how to capture the major geophysical parameters that drive their variability, and how to develop the forward operator as a function of these geophysical parameters. So there are community microwave uh, emission models for different surfaces. And, and this is one uh, that is uh, adopted at ECMWF, the uh, European uh, Weather Forecast uh, Center. And uh, for instance, uh, you have the reference here and it will deal with the soil module. It will have a vegetation module as well as a snow module. 
with uh, different possibilities for the different uh, different aspect of the of the land surface um, uh, properties. However, uh, this is a specific work at 1.4 gigahertz for SMOS. Uh, these type of models, before bias correction, they can show very large uh, biases. This is sorry. Calvin, and this is a model that has been specifically developed for this frequency. So it tells you about the difficulty to really fit this type of models. And after bias correction, you get something better, but it is still um, it is still difficult to, um, to 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 have this type of relevant model all over the globe. And this is at one point four gigahertz. How is this model applicable to other frequencies with consistent hypothesis and inputs? This is a key question. Over snow, also you, over sea ice, you also have very specific models that have been developed. Uh, this is an example here. Uh, it is based on a, on a model that has been uh, available for many years, a MEMOS model. And um, it can deal with very complex structure and large number of inputs, but it is really complex. And so far it has been tested at six gigahertz vertical polarization and this incidence angle with answer observation. And even for that specific condition between the observation here and the model, you can still see rather large differences between the simulations and the observed brightness temperature after uh, debiasing. So how is this applicable to H polarization? How is it applicable to other answer frequencies? This, these are real questions. So physically based microwave emissivity models are very challenging for global applications over land, snow, ice, and sea ice. They have difficulties to capture the high spatial and temporal heterogeneities. The interaction between the signal and the surface is very complex with volume and surface scattering at the same time. And it is very difficult to access the necessary input parameters needed for the model. And there is still a question, which are the key drivers of the signal variability for all these surfaces? Are they included in the model inputs that we can use? And are they available at large scale? We still, for some surface, don't really know exactly uh, to which parameter we are sensitive. So what has been done uh, in the past years is to derive emissivities from satellite directly. So this is the equation we had before. Okay, from this equation, we can extract the emissivity. And knowing the atmospheric uh, parameters here uh, from uh, radiative transfer code uh, fed with uh, reanalysis, for instance, you can calculate the emissivity from the brightness temperatures directly measured by the satellite. And this has been applied to window channels for different instruments and under clear sky only uh, condition, or they have been embedded in full retrieval of the atmosphere and surface. And these are references where this type of exercise has been uh, done. And um, these emissivities are calculated online in window channels and propagated to other channels. And this uh, em or emissivity atlases can be used. But still, uh, you can have uh, errors uh, related to these emissivities. And the different sources of errors are related to the surface temperature, which is here in this equation. Is the surface temperature, the skin temperature, estimated from a numerical weather prediction or from infrared estimates? Do we have subsurface contribution? And in that case, in that, it's not the, the surface temperature here, it's not the skin temperature, but an effective temperature depending upon the frequency. And this surface temperature is clearly the dominant error, especially for the lower frequency. The atmospheric contribution in this calculation um, can be high, especially at high frequencies. And um, that can also be a source of error in this emissivity calculation. Uh, another approximation is a specular approximation. It is, is it always valid? 
And is there a need to add a Lambertian contribution close to nadir and at high frequency, especially over snow and ice? And you have several papers about this issue. So there is an, uh, an atlas that ex exists. It's, it is TELSEM, the tool to estimate land surface emissivities at microwaves and millimeter waves. Uh, we have been working on that. It provides a global uh, atlas, uh, it's a global atlas of emissivity for all continental and sea ice surfaces from 18 to 700 gigahertz uh, at monthly mean time scale and 25 kilometer spatial resolution. These are the its inputs and these outputs. It provides realistic first guess estimate along with uh, covariance errors. So it can be used under different, um, different uh, application. And this could be updated with new emissivity estimates, especially below 18 gigahertz with other instruments. So these emissivity estimates derived from satellites have been compared to models. And this is, for instance, observation from uh, to models as well as to, um, to observations. So this is answer observation, uh, vertical polarization. So these are simulations uh, using TELSEM. And this is a more quantitative comparison at two different frequencies in blue 19, in red 89 gigahertz. This is a comparison between observation and uh, the emissivity atlas uh, over grassland, desert, and snow on ice. And this is from the emissivity derived from the, from the observations. And this is from, from emissivities derived from, uh, from a model, the CRTM model from NOAA. So um, here you can see that the error here is smaller with this emissivity uh, derived from, uh, from satellite data, although the answer observation used here haven't been directly used in TELSEM. Over snow, we have approximately the same thing. The snow modeled uh, or the snow, the snow emissivity derived from the satellite uh, are being compared to answer observation at six uh, gigahertz, 18 gigahertz, 89 gigahertz. And here you see the difference between the observation and the simulation uh, from the satellite derived emissivity in blue from the model in red and for the different polarization. And you can see that most of the time, uh, the, the atlas, the emissivity atlases are providing better fit to the observation than the simulations. So as expected, the satellite derived land surface emissivity provides reasonable spatial and temporal variability, as well as frequency co-variabilities, which is very important uh, when you are using multiple frequencies for retrieval. So it's important to have the right co-variabilities between the, 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 the emissivities at different frequencies. But they do not tell you about the key geophysical parameters that drive their variability. And for consistent surface and atmospheric inversion, how to relate the satellite derived surface contribution to the geophysical parameters? This is a, a question, uh, especially toward couple land atmosphere uh, assimilation system. So is there a possibility to derive statistical forward operators anchored to satellite observation and consistent for multi-frequency, multi-instrument operation? So I will just show you an analysis over sea ice that we did recently to illustrate a little bit uh, this, uh, this aspect. So we have a lot of observation in the microwave uh, available, passive as well as active, to better understand the physics behind the interaction between the different signals and the, the surfaces. This is, for instance, for two moments during the uh, winter, uh, the Arctic winter, November and March. This is um, observation of, with SMAP, with AMSER at two frequencies, with ASCAT, and with an altimeter, meaning uh, radar at nadir. Okay, so this is at nadir at 36 gigahertz, this is 5 gigahertz at 40 degrees. 
And you can see structures that uh, are very different from a, an, an instrument to the next and that can change over the season, okay? And um, these structures are not random at all. And they are pretty, uh, pretty uh, stable from a year to the next, at least um, in general. So how to analyze the co-variability of this, these multiple observations in space and time to facilitate their physical interpretation and their link with the geophysical parameters. So for that, we uh, applied a classification of one year of SMAP and AMSER2 uh, observations, as well as ASCAD data of the Arctic to extract the dominant patterns and the co-variabilities using an it, um, artificial intelligence self-organizing classification. And so we obtain clusters, okay, that tells you how the different frequencies and different uh, instrument, because this is uh, active, this is passive, are varying, okay? So uh, this is brightness temperature here, this is uh, scattering here, and you can see here um, that different signatures are observed for the different clusters depending on the frequencies and on the mode of the instrument. And we have been working on this to, because this summarizes the signatures that have been observed over a full year with this type of instrument to facilitate the physical interpretation of these signatures. And this classification over one year uh, can, be, um, can be applied to the different uh, months in the year. So this is November, this is March, this is May, and this is um, September. So from a season to the next, uh, the clusters are changing and they're telling you about the physics behind uh, the, um, the, the, the interaction between the radiation and the different clusters. So this analysis showed that here, for instance, with increasing brightness temperature here, you are in increasing the, the sea ice concentration is increasing, okay? For these clusters, they are corresponding to increasing uh, sea ice concentration. Here, you see that only the blue line, which is 1.4 gigahertz, is changing. The other ones at the other passive microwave frequencies are more or less fixed. The sea ice concentration is close to 100, but the sea ice thickness is increasing. As you might know, at 1.4 gigahertz, it is possible to estimate the sea ice thickness uh, for small thickness at least with the 1.4 gigahertz. And this is directly observable uh, over this uh, cluster analysis. And here, so 36 gigahertz is decreasing in terms of brightness temperature in the passive mode. And you can see that for the scattering at five gigahertz, it's strongly increasing. So meaning that here you have some scattering features, both at 36 gigahertz in passive mode and at six gigahertz in scattering mode, but not at all at six gigahertz in uh, passive mode. So we have been using a sophisticated radiative transfer model, uh, which is SMRT, uh, developed by uh, Gislain Picard, uh, to try to understand the key parameters that are driving these different variabilities. And we observe and we simulated that as a function of snow depths, this is a function of snow depths, and this is brightness temperature for the different frequencies. Actually, the snow layer above the sea ice with regular small grains cannot scatter the passive microwaves at 30, like 18 and 36 gigahertz as has been observed uh, from the, with uh, the satellite observation. So it's just not possible to, uh, to scatter as much as observed with only 
uh, snow particles uh, of regular snowpack. And the presence of depth ore over multi-year ice have, has to be added to explain the passive microwave observation at 18 and 36 gigahertz. However, these depth ores do not affect the scattering at uh, five gigahertz as observed from ASCAT. And you have to, uh, to assume some surface roughness at the ice snow interface of the multi-year ice in order to fit uh, simultaneously the passive microwave and the active microwave as observed here. Because this, you have to fit all the parameters together, all the observation together with given um, given uh, physical parameters, because when you do an analysis of only one parameter at a time, you can have a multitude of parameters that will fit, for instance, uh, that line, which is observed at 36 gigahertz. But it is very difficult and very constraining to fit the different uh, observation at the different frequencies and different mode, backscattering here and brightness temperature here, at the same time. So it gives you constraints uh, for um, better uh, modeling the, the, the sea ice and its snowpack on top. Um, and it provides you with much better insight into the physics of the radiative transfer for both active and passive mode. So with this kind of understanding in mind, we have been doing some preliminary estimation of the emissivity uh, simulated here and observed here at 18 gigahertz. So this is uh, for uh, the Arctic. This is uh, for March uh, at uh, 18 gigahertz vertical polarization, horizontal polarization simulations and observations. And you can see that we can reproduce pretty well the different structures. It's not perfect, far from it, but we reproduce them uh, okay. And we have been doing the same for the Antarctic here uh, during the, the winter in Antarctica. Uh, this is September, vertical polarization, horizontal polarization. And this is an idea of the differences between the simulations and the observations over the Arctic at gig six gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, 18 gigahertz and 38 gigahertz simultaneously. This is minus five, 15, this is plus 15. This is without any adjustments to the, to the, to the model. So this is just a statistical model derived uh, from the observations and from our understanding of the physics to reproduce the brightness temperatures. So multi-frequency, multi-instrument analysis of the surface signature is suggested to better understand the physics and isolate the driving geophysical parameters. Once the key driving geophysical variables are isolated, it is possible to develop the forward model simulator to reproduce the observed signals, possibly based on uh, artificial intelligence. Um, so maybe I will jump to the conclusion because I have many more uh, many more subjects to cover, but uh, maybe time is running. Nazareno, what do you think? Okay, sorry, I, uh, I was muted. Uh, <laughs> if you want to go very quickly through uh, through the next uh, slide, uh, just uh, to give to the people uh, um, uh, the flavor about the, uh, it. Yes, yes. Because okay. then the material uh, will be made yes. available. Okay, the, will be, the we will make available uh, the material. Okay, so I can okay. go through it pretty quickly. So okay. we have been do analyzing uh, data over the deserts, and for that we have been uh, using GMI observation. The global um, the, the instrument of all, on board the global uh, precipitation mission, GPM, uh, because it provides the dyno cycle of the of the observation. Because most of the microwave instruments they are sun synchronous, and so you don't have access to the dyno cycle. So these GMI observations are very interesting because they provide you with some uh, dyno cycle, and these are observations at 10 gigahertz at 19 gigahertz, at 6 p.m. 
uh, 6 a.m., 6 in the morning at, and at noon. And you can see very strange structures that are coming up here where the brightness temperature here at 10 gigahertz, for instance, doesn't change much from uh, morning to mid noon to noon. And at 89 gigahertz, they are changing much more. And this is related uh, to the penetration of the signal within the subsurface, okay? So this is the dynal cycle of the temperature at the subsurface as estimated from, um, from uh, reanalysis as a function of time in the day. So this is a surface skin temperature, and this is a surface in the, in the, this is the temperature in the subsurface at different uh, depths in the subsurface. And this is the micro, passive microwave observation. And you can see that in this specific place, it is very flat. So you are not uh, observing the dynal cycle of the surface temperature, but you are observing something which is deeper in the, in the subsurface. Other, in other places here, for instance, you have a, a dynal cycle observed by the different frequencies in, uh, in, um, in the microwave, it is much stronger and very similar from a frequency to the next, okay? So it means that you are sensitive to the skin temperature here and you don't have much penetration into the subsurface, okay? So we have been analyzing that and uh, we have been estimating the emissivity as well as the penetration depth for uh, different frequencies uh, here, it's the emissivity at 18 gigahertz vertical and horizontal polarization. Uh, this is penetration depth at 10 gigahertz and at 89 gigahertz. And you can see some very interesting structures here that are actually related to sand deserts where the, uh, the penetration depth is very, uh, is rather deep, larger than 15 centimeter at 10 gigahertz because of the dryness and the type of uh, sand that you have in presence. Uh, we have been analyzing as well different structures that are observable in the emissivities and that have been related to um, also to infrared emissivities at 10 gigahertz and um, at 10 microns. And these um, very low emissivities here as are actually related to the presence of carbonate outcrops in these regions. So, um, so we are sensitive to mineral outcrops, even in passive microwaves. And in terms of penetration depth, we have been comparing it with backscatter, for instance, at five gigahertz. And you can see that these patterns here with very low backscattering are also um, represented here in terms of penetration depth. So everything is very consistent. And uh, it is also related to the infrared emissivities uh, in this, uh, in the, that are pretty low at nine microns. And this is also related to the dry silicate sands that have low emissivities because of um, spectral features at this specific uh, wavelengths in the infrared emissivities. So over the desert, uh, the high variability of the surface contribution is associated to mineral outcrops that are usually not considered in models. So they can't be modeled by radiative transfer, uh, classic radiative transfer model, and to penetration depths in dry sands. So for a simulation of the microwave surface contribution over desert, uh, we advise to use climatology of microwave satellite derived surface emissivity. And they are consistent with infrared emissivity, which is very reassuring. And to develop a thermal diffusion model to estimate the effective emission temperature tied to surface skin temperature, for instance, derived from, um, from a reanalysis and using pre calculated penetration depth that we can provide the community with. I might stop here, or maybe I can talk a little bit about uh, some um, testing of the information content of multi frequencies uh, and their synergies over the tropic for vegetation characterization. So, uh, as you might know, uh, vegetation uh, parameter 
parameters that are affecting passive microwaves are very difficult to tackle because most of the time uh, it is a mixture of um, of um, what is available in terms of uh, of structure in the vegetation as well as water content of the vegetation that is affecting the emissivities. So in order to understand that a bit better and to analyze uh, what is uh, available from from instruments passive instruments such as SNAP or AMSER, we have been conducting some statistical um, analysis in order to see what is the relationship between these frequencies here and two, um, two parameters that are commonly used for vegetation estimation, the NDVI from, uh, from uh, visible and near infrared and AGC, above ground carbon that has been estimated by, for instance, by people like uh, Saatchi. And uh, we have been um, doing some information content analysis using neural network inversion of these two vegetation parameters, the NDVI and the above ground carbon, uh, using different frequency combination of passive microwaves, uh, including SMAP and AMSER. And it looks like using 1.4 gigahertz, the NDVI retrieval errors that are indicated here is lower, uh, this is in green, than for the other, um, the other frequencies, yes, green, is lower than for the other combination. And uh, for, a, so for, for, not for NDVI, sorry, for AG, AGC. So you have much lower retrieval errors for AGC with the low frequencies. And um, so 1.4 gigahertz alone uh, is pretty good for biomass estimation in tropical areas. And answer E frequency combination is efficient to reproduce NDVI because here in, in uh, the NDVI here, error in NDVI is better for answer than it is for the lower frequency, which was expected, but here with this type of method, you can quantify it. Okay, so I was very quick on the last topics. So in conclusion, over ocean, we have rather robust radiative transfer models. And there is an ongoing community effort to refine a reference physical model, which is called PARMIO, and to ensure its maintenance over time, which is very important. And this is a joint effort by uh, international community involving ECNWF, involving NOAA, involving NASA. A corresponding fast emissivity model has been developed based on neural network and in its incorporation to RTTOF is underway, and it's likely that it will be also integrated in CRTM. Over land, snow, ice, and sea ice, physically based radiative transfer models are still very challenging for large scale applications, especially under multiple instrument conditions and diverse environments. So, satellite derived emissivity estimates can provide reasonable first guess with realistic multi frequency co variabilities spatial patterns and temporal behaviors at global scale. So we have a lot of satellite data available and we can learn a lot from this multi-mission data set, possibly using, uh, using artificial intelligence techniques that can uh, make it possible to handle these large dimension data sets. So, and there is a need to gain a sort of understanding of the geophysical parameters that drive the surface contribution variabilities consistently at multiple frequencies. And this is very important because uh, having something which works at one frequency is not that complicated, but it can work for the wrong reason. So it is important to have consistency at multiple frequencies and observing conditions at the same time. So physical aware statistical parameterization of the surface contribution could be a solution. It could be done as a function of instrument characteristics, geophysical variable from the land surface models or from the ocean models, 
and using eventually additional ancillary data if needed. So consistent forward operator codes um, are to be developed to be used for forward and inverse modeling consistently for coupled assimilation systems. Thank you. So this is my email address if you have any questions. And I see that there is a chat. How can I access it? Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, very interesting uh, and overview and very interesting uh, new, uh, let's say, prospects uh, and new ideas. Uh, now we have some time for question or for discussion. Uh, we, you can use the chat, of course, but to, you can also, I think, uh, uh, mute yourself and uh, make question directly online. I have a, a question. What would be the typical penetration depth of the microwaves over the desert? And how much of a variability is that? So it, it strongly depends upon the frequencies and a typical penetration depths. Actually, for instance, at 10 gigahertz, you have something like 15 centimeters or more in this area where you have very dry sand. At 90 gigahertz, you can see that it's much less. It goes up to something like three centimeters. But of course, that depends upon the hypothesis that we made. We used um, the surface skin temperature from the array analysis of ECMWF. And we developed a thermal diffusion model in order to, um, to, di to, to diffuse this uh, temperature down to the, to the ground. And uh, there is a, a paper uh, from one of our students that is being prepared but we also have an estimate of this penetration depth from an old paper uh, uh, from the previous century, I would say, <laughs> where we did similar exercise, but with satellite data that were not as relevant as the GM GMI uh, observations that are really providing the diurnal cycle of the brightness temperatures as, uh, as can be seen here at different times of the day. So this is typically what we have in terms of penetration depth. And I six gigahertz, uh, um, yes, we have six gigahertz. Uh, we, we also have a deeper penetration. Very interesting, very interesting. Thank yes. you. Catherine, we have a, a question in the chat. Uh, is there any added advantage of microwave derived emissivity over IR, uh, infrared emissivity? Okay, this is uh, depend also on the application, of course. Yes, the... yes, <laughs> because uh, because uh, actually, as we saw just at the beginning, uh, the infrared emissivities are rather um, on not uh, changing that much in terms of surface uh, properties, and which is good because when you want to retrieve the the land surface temperature from the infrared, it is good to have something which is rather stable. With the passive microwave, we are also trying to derive land surface temperature under clouds, and it's more complicated because of this varying emissivity. But because the microwave emissivity is varying with the uh, surface properties, you can also estimate the surface properties from uh, the, the microwave emissivities. So, Yes, uh, depending on the type of applications you have, it is very interesting to have uh, the, infra the microwave emissivities with respect to the infrared emissivity. And of course, when you want to assimilate uh, passive microwave observations within a numerical weather prediction model with sounders that are partly affected by the surface, you also want to have certain microwave emissivities in order to correct for the atmospheric signal. Uh, okay, another question. Uh, Catherine, you showed the seasonal variation uh, uh, of for emissivity over ice and desert area. Do these seasonal emissivity, seasonal variation for perennial grasslands lead us to measure a specific or better sensing period, or it's better to have uh, 
more data in time? Uh, actually, the emissivities over grassland or, uh, or, or vegetation or soil in general, uh, from that you can estimate the soil moisture as well as some uh, vegetation properties. So um, there are seasonal variations over, over grassland. Uh, there are um, seasonal variations over, uh, over forests, um, depending on the, the type of vegetation you have in presence and depending on the soil moisture of the, uh, in the soil. Uh, so you really have a lot of variability in terms of season uh, in the emissivities that can be related to properties from the vegetation or from the soil. Any other question? Okay, uh, uh, please. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Catherine. I am thinking about uh, the application of microwave, passive microwave emissivity, emissivity at Mars. Say, you know, the Martian surface is impacted by numerous uh, meteorite impact. And due to this meteorite impact, the surface composition might change compared to the surrounding area. Is it possible to better characterize uh, the compositional chains uh, uh, due to much uh, meteorite impact uh, at Mars, uh, applying this uh, emissivity and penetration capability of microwave in, uh, observation? I'm glad you are asking this question because we are just preparing uh, uh, <laughs> um, a project with a student who has been working uh, on the uh, on the um, on the icy moons of uh, Saturn's actual Saturn actually. So you see, it's same type of physics. And uh, on the it was a Cassini mission that she was using, and uh, Cassini mission had at the same time passive microwave uh, radiometers as well as uh, radars. So she was using both radars and uh, and uh, passive microwaves over a Titan in order to get some information about the ice over Titan and of course over the other planets that can be uh, adapted. I mean, it's the uh, same type of physical problems and using different observations at different frequencies and with different modes, meaning active and passive with radiometers and, uh, and uh, radars, you can derive some properties. But of course, it's, it's complicated over, over planets because you have to make a strong assumptions about what is there and about the different materials that you have in presence and the different, uh, the different effects that could, uh, that could play a role. But typically, yes, that can be done. Uh, this type of uh, exercise and this type of understanding can be also obtained over planets, Mars and other planets, um, using passive microwave combined with infrared information, because usually you also need infrared information to get some idea about the temperature, of course, and possibly combining it with active microwave like radars or altimeters in order to get additional information to better constrain your physical problems. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, I have a very uh, simple question, uh, Catherine. Uh, you know uh, better than me that CIMR, the European uh, um, New Generation Copernicus uh, mission based on uh, microwave radiometer will have uh, a fully polarimetric capabilities. Yes. Uh, I know that there are there were in the past some uh, uh, effort to, to generate, to develop uh, a polarimetric model of ocean. Yes. Uh, but uh, are there any uh, model that is capable to simulate uh, the fully polarimetric uh, emission uh, over land? Um, the problem is that um, uh, polarimetric uh, models over land uh, haven't been uh, really developed. They could be developed uh, at least theoretically, uh, but uh, so far uh, we haven't observed much of um, 
of uh, polarimetric, I mean, the, the circular polarization over, over land, because you have a lot of scattering. Most of it is random, except in very specific structures, for instance, on, uh, on uh, I know that over deserts, uh, over some ergs uh, that are well aligned, uh, some uh, um, polarization has been observed uh, uh, in circular polarization, um, but uh, but it's uh, it's um, it's already very complicated to simulate the vertical and horizontal polarization uh, over land. So uh, simulating uh, the circular polarization, uh, the, all the full Stokes vector is really, really hard. Okay. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it could be done, of course, on a, on, a, uh, on a local basis, but on a global basis, I don't see how we can do that, especially because we are not observing much of it. Uh, over ocean, I, I didn't mention, but over ocean, the two scale models that we developed is also dealing with the, um, with the full stock vector. Okay, thank you. One more question uh, from the audience in the chat. Uh, somebody raise his hand. Go ahead. Can I go? This is Maurizio. Maurizio, yeah. Okay, just want to okay, thank you for your seminar, first of all. And I like to underline two things, general things, but it's, I guess it's important for everybody and for ourselves. Of course, when you have a model, it's not simply predicting the measurements that you can have by the satellite. And even the discrepancy may teach us more mm -hmm. than the agreements. That's one yes. thing that otherwise, yes. you know, I'm not like, you know. And the second issue is that it's, uh, I guess it should be underline, especially when we try to mix the, the let me say, active sensor, SAR sensor, whatever, with passive sensor, is the resolution scale. Yes. Because the modeling, you know, but I want to underline because it's important. It's not always so easy or at all comparable, a different scale. Yes. I remember early times where scatterometer years one SAR measurements apparently made the with the same sensor, but a very different scale, spatial scale, they, they show discrepancies. It was not strange. This is the physics of change. So probably what I'm saying that we can teach, each, we can learn it by the different experience, by the disagreement, and so, and not only by the agreements, and uh, probably they teach more us. And the scale is important, the modeling scale, I mean modeling scale of course even the measurement scale but that's that's clear and yes. um, i mean probably I, I don't be i don't believe we are so so i mean of course we want to do more but that's another thing but but we we have uh, done a lot uh, during these years that so uh, thank you again and just what just a note uh, let me say it's not a comment if you like more than yeah. the, but more i than fully the, agree yeah. here i talk mostly about uh, large scales because we have global, uh, global uh, and in mind and climate modeling in mind. So, so it's really, I, I, maybe I should have uh, insisted on that. It's large scale uh, uh, emissivity modeling that I'm talking about. And of course, for very local um, modeling, uh, models can, uh, can, uh, can work um, uh, maybe more adapted. The problem is, that for uh, weather prediction, for instance, for climate uh, estimates of many multiple parameters, uh, you need to have something which is generic. And I have to say that, of course, at small scale, you can understand better processes and you can understand things a bit uh, and you can model things. But the problem is that sometimes at small scale, uh, you don't have the full variability of, um, of uh, conditions that you observe at large scales. And, uh, and I know that for instance, for sea ice, uh, some specific models have been developed over very specific uh, circumstances and environments, and they are just not, uh, not uh, uh, correct. They are not robust as soon as you start looking at global scales. And sometimes looking at global scale, it, um, it emphasizes better the strong, the strong, uh, the stronger sensitivities to uh, different parameters. And you learn a lot as well. Thank, Thank you, you for your comment. 
Okay, Catherine, probably the last question uh, from Sang Muli, uh, yeah. who noticed that, that uh, as for um, uh, sounder, we have generally cross-track yes. sensor with the changing uh, uh, angle. incident ang observation angle. So he's asking if you do have any plan to provide the emissivity product as a function of the incident angle. Yes, we do, and we do, and we did already, actually, because of uh, TELSEM, the, 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 the emissivity atlas that we produced, uh, is dealing with, um, with um, uh, variation in incidence angle and with polarization as well. Uh, the problem is that, as you might all know, uh, with cross-track scanner, um, the incidence angle is one issue, but also the fact that most uh, most um, sounders they don't have vertical and horizontal polarization at the same time. It's a mixture of V and H for each incidence angle. So it's very difficult from the analysis of the sounder data in cross-track mode to derive the emissivity as a function of incidence angle plus polarization. So we have been playing that game already when we derived TELSEM. Uh, we could do more with the newer instruments that are available. So we can revisit that and we have planned to do it, but uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but there is something already uh, in place, which is available with, uh, with TELSEM and uh, that is distributed with RTTOF and CRTM actually. Okay, Catherine, uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, and thank you everybody uh, who attended this uh, web very interesting webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed. I, I think that uh, we can stop here. Uh, I would like to inform everyone that these uh, webinar uh, are recorded and they are made available through the YouTube channel of the GRSS Society. Uh, so uh, I would like to thanks everybody and to okay to give uh, uh, for the next webinar uh, to welcome you for a next uh, webinar of the uh, MIRS technical committee. So uh, goodbye everyone and thank you again, uh, uh, Catherine. Okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. 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 -bye.